have no idea what I'm doing. This might be interesting to people. I hope it is. It might not. If it isn't, you can just tune out for a little bit. It's interesting to me. <laughs> so I'm talking about the psychological demands of technology. So it's actually going to be a bit broader than what Steve said, because I tend to be more interested the broader you go. Uh, I'm a little academic. So that's me. Uh, in case you don't know, it's not particularly interesting. What you will notice, though, however, if you pay attention to me in any venue, is you'll see a lot of this. <laughs> and you'll see a lot of this. <laughs> and less frequently, but more expensively, you'll see a lot of this. <laughs> All right, so there, there are two things about me that are important here uh, for the topic. One is that I am geeky, which means I tend to believe that facts win. The other is that I am an only child, which means I tend to lack empathy. <laughs> <laughs> This is true. I speak only for myself. Other only children might have great empathy. I ain't one of them. I recently moved to San Francisco about a year ago uh, to join a startup and for other reasons, personal reasons. Uh, and I read this book called Hooked, written by some guy at Stanford. It's mainly about how to use the mechanics of addiction for profit and how to build the mechanics of addiction into products. I have a particular view of that. It's start out. That's how I feel about it. <laughs> Somewhere buried in this book as a tertiary subpoint to some other point that was subliminal to some other thing, he talks about Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, being an only child and lacking empathy, I have an inherent difficulty in understanding support groups. <laughs> and having never participated in one or been on the receiving end of one, it makes it worse. So I accept the fact that they work. There's evidence, proof, research that they work. The hard time understanding why they work or, the, or that they should work. So the gentleman in the book talks about a support group providing empathy and experience. So these people have been there, done that. Some of them are doing it at the same time. So they have, there's proof. There's proof that there is a next step and that the next step is valid and it can be achieved. But then they also provide positive reinforcement to get you to, to help you get to the next step and support. Both these things, <clears throat> leaning on the earlier points about me liking empathy, have been confusing to me my whole life. But I read this little paragraph in this book about Alcoholics Anonymous, which reminded me of this book that I read a long time ago. And in this book, this particular researcher makes the point that the source of confidence, the, if you think of it as the biological, or the psychophysical source of confidence is from efficacy. You do things when you're really little and you have success in doing things, thus you have a sense of efficacy. That sense of efficacy translates into confidence, which is where the psychophysical basis of self-esteem comes from. Uh, so that made me think about what happens when you try to do something new. Generally, you suck. <laughs> and when you suck, you feel like this. <laughs> You suck, your efficacy is challenged, your confidence is challenged, your esteem is challenged, which is hard. Brings me back to these guys. So if it is the case that doing something new is difficult and challenges you, changing something old to do something new takes something even greater. Changing behavior actually hurts and community support fills the esteem gap that is created when you change behavior. So you're taking something you know how to do, where you have an efficacious experience of doing a thing and achieving a result, and you have to throw it out and do something else and start from, you're not just starting from no experience, no efficacy, building experience and efficacy and confidence and esteem. You're starting from, I have esteem, I'm gonna cut that esteem out of my life. There will be a gap and I will learn to do something new, which hopefully I will find efficacy, confidence, and esteem at, at some point in time. In the middle, there's pain, because you have cut out a chunk of your confidence. So they will supply the confidence you cannot have until you can have it. And all of a sudden, uh, I was no longer skeptical about support and help and talking to people and groups and empathy and what needs to happen for change. Which brings us back to the whole technology thing. We have a lot of things that we are throwing at people, a lot of popular ideas. 
a lot of stuff. Cloud, DevOps, Buddha, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Cambrianly exploding, one might say, at an ever faster pace. We are producing, evangelizing, talking about, pushing, trying to get people to adopt, and shoving down our own throats new patterns, architectures, cultures, metaphors, interfaces. We demand of ourselves and of everybody else that they change, that they experience failure, that they lose confidence, that they lose esteem, and that they hurt a little bit to get to the place we want them to get. <laughs> if you're going to do that, if you're going to create the gap and demand that everybody create the gap, you should give them some help. So part of it is just UX. And I don't want to, when I say just UX, that's an enormous thing. It's not just design. It is not just user-centered design. It is psychological-centered design. There is a certain way people work, or a certain way a large portion of people work. And when you build a thing that demands them to suffer, you should make some attempt to alleviate that suffering so they can get to the goal. Design for efficacy. When people talk about creating little wins in products and creating little stepwise ways for people to get from point A to point B, the reason you need to do that is because you need to create the experience of efficacy at every step of the way. And you need to build on ideas that last. Well, you don't need to. I think you should. I try to. Interfaces change, metaphors change, implementations change. But if you're, but the goal is still generally the same, and the starting point is still generally the same, and the end point is still generally the same with almost every product. Unless you're doing something that's actually net new, and in my view, there are very, 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 very few things that are actually net new. Most of them are efficiencies, or better ways of achieving the same result. If that's the case, then that new way of achieving the result doesn't necessitate throwing out an entire framework or an entire idea or an entire pattern. It just says, well, throw out the parts of it that could be done better. And then you can provide a mental bridge for people to get from where they started to where you'd like them to end up. Instead of creating discontinuities of experience, you should be filling the discontinuities of experience. Instead of saying, abandon this, adopt this, say, abandon this and do this next thing. And then do this other next thing, this other next thing, do this other next thing, all of which are little steps on the way to a broader end and create community. Uh, I am not, well, I guess I sort of am. I have experience with open source. I have also a lot of experience with not ever touching open source. I've been on both sides of that line. On both sides of that line, what I've found is if you're willing to provide whoever you're serving or whoever you're building for a way for them to help themselves and each other. That's built into what you're doing, built into the product, built into the service, built into the method. Then you don't necessarily have to be the best at designing and UX and filling all the gaps because they're gonna do it themselves. But they can't do it by themselves. They can only do it together. Remove friction, all friction. Friction is generally unnecessary. A little friction is inevitable. A lot of friction is never necessary. Again, unless you're doing something that's really, 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 really net new, which is rare. And break barriers. Every time you create a gap or discontinuity or require someone to make a leap, you are not, you're erecting a barrier, which again, I believe is generally unnecessary. Because everything we build, all these ideas, all these patterns, architectures, ways of doing things, we're all trying to get to the same end result. It looks something like this in someone's head. That's it, thanks. Yeah. In some ways, it's almost better if it breaks the experience because it, it makes it more powerful. I, I just kind of like 
you have to, can you, it's not really a question as much as like, can you elaborate on, you know, is that, do you think that's true? Is there something there? Yeah, so I actually do think that's true. I think um, if you're trying to create significant change, you have no choice but to at least espouse a vision that's iconoclastic and sets you apart and shows a dramatic difference from where we are to where you think a thing should be. But there's no getting there that way. Right. So, so as, as, long as, you, as long as you're able to accept the reality of that, and by the way, this is why all of the large things, like SOA version 1.0, fail. Because the vision is present and no one provides an actual bridged stepwise, human consumable way of getting there from where we are. Uh, could you give an example of some new thing that you think was uh, brought up in a good way and, you know, that, that, I don't know, makes it easier to assimilate or, or whatever? Can you give a good example? Mm. No, so not of a thing, of people, yes, so that's different. So I can give examples of people who are, who are managing to successfully take something that is actually different and make it consumable for others. Adrian's a good example, to your left. Uh, John Allspot's another good example. Um, but, if you, but if you look at some of their talks and the words they use and, and the, their presentations, they suggest something that is radical to other people. But if you talk to them personally, and you say, well, how do you do that? They will, well, they, because they've thought about this, and they have made the transition, and they've thought about the effort it takes to get there and, and be successful. Uh, what they will actually discuss with you is something that doesn't hurt. Yeah, so, but still, I mean, it, you know, you use the example of, of uh, SOA 1.0. <laughs> Yeah. And we could say that the market services and such is sort of SOA 2.0. Uh -huh. But another different, and, and SOA 1.0 didn't have Adrian, which is one of their problems, but... <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it did, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 In the Adrian 1.0 no, 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 no. <laughs> Yes, we didn't end up with, we had Adrian 1.0. But, but the other thing is, I remember those SOA technologies, and they were complicated, hard, very sophisticated things that I found daunting yes. and I'm not so easily daunted. And uh, you know, and then 2.0 ones to use that term, the microservices are enormously easier to yes. use. And so uh, it seems like uh, when I was watching your presentation, I was thinking of things like that about how some technologies are just you know, overwhelming some technologies actually aren't. Uh... That's, and that's the making a consumable part. Like the, to, to get to the big idea, the thing you produce doesn't have to be daunting. It's only daunting because you chose to make it daunting. But just a quick comment on too, right? I mean, SOA 1.0 was really, you know, Corba 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they were, so SOA, right, was dramatically simpler you're right, you're than right. Com, right, or yeah. Corba. Uh, you know, the microservices are kind of now dramatically simpler than, yeah. than SOA. You know, it took us a bunch of tries to get that concept. Everyone will eventually end up reinventing Corba again. It's daunting because you decided to make it daunting. It seems almost the other way around. It's not daunting because people work really, really hard to make it not daunting. Yes. But it, it's it's similar to the interfaces for the robots that you were working on. I mean, it used to be horrible. Yeah. It used to be painful and just, you know, you want to grab your eyes out and prefer to, if you prefer to work on enterprise software than something, I can do it. <laughs> yeah, but, but if you look at if you look at the, the JavaScript interface from Johnny Five to Castle, I mean things have gotten radically simple to the fact to the point where I, I might be able to do it. Like, well, just, just look at just look at Docker. You know, not not to go onto a popular trope, but uh, I'm in marketing. I've been off keys as someone who programs or does systems work for more than uh, a long time. <laughs> for a while now. 
and uh, and I'm at a startup that has a really complicated microservices based thing that's large and really com really it's actually it's not that complicated if you look at it but it's very complicated if you understand how it works um, and on day one reading something some engineer wrote up I was able to get the whole thing running in a bunch of Docker containers on this little MacBook Air in about five minutes flat. Docker is trivially easy to use for someone who was once an engineer and has a computer science degree but hasn't used it in like a decade. That is making something that is actually interesting and could be dramatic in how it changes how we deal with infrastructure, consumable. Cool. And on that note, I think we're good. Thank you.